is the day one of Hearth and Harvest Apples Week. Thanks for tuning in to this virtual experience, which we've designed to bring us together this season with friends and family near and far, virtually most likely. I'm Lindsay from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And I'm Rachel, director and founder of the Museum of Food and Culture. This week's theme is apples. If you'd like to make a donation in support of this program because you like what you see, please head to the link below and make a gift to support both our museums. We thank you. And now let's get started. So today's video, we're going to join Mara Rapkin as she explores a favorite apple delight, cider. So cozy up, grab your favorite apple, apple beverage and enjoy. Hi, my name is Mara Rapkin. I'm the owner of Napkin LLC. I graduated with a master's in food studies and an MBA at Chatham University, where I wrote my thesis on cider and apples. And today I'm presenting on the history of cider. This presentation is a brief dive into the history of cider and spans millennia and the expanse of the Northern Hemisphere. Cider's story is inextricably linked to the agricultural production and migration of apples. Apples are edible fruits with the Latin name malus, a species of tree or shrub in the Rosaceae family. They grow in temperate zones of the Northern Hemisphere. A wild apple found in Kazakhstan with the Latin name Malus siversi is said to be the genetic ancestor of Malus domestica, or what we know today as the common eating apple. The fruit and its seeds were traded and transported on the Silk Road through Western Asia into Europe. Each apple seed produces a genetically unique apple tree so there have been innumerable varieties of apples through time. Propagation of any specific variety can be achieved through grafting techniques of the trees. Different apple varieties ripen at different times from July through November. Upon harvest, apples can be stored to extend their shelf life. But another way to preserve apples is to press apple juice and ferment that juice into hard cider. Cider is the common term in Europe for juice from palm fruits. Juice today in America is usually some version of cider that has been pasteurized and heat treated. Apples are washed and pressed and the juice is then stored with minimal exposure to oxygen. Cider can be sweet or hard. Sweet cider is unfermented, fresh juice. Hard cider is the product of alcoholic fermentation. In alcoholic fermentation, yeast, either added or wild from the air, consumes sugars in the cider to create alcohol and carbon dioxide. Cider will ferment in as little as a few weeks. As long as there is a limit to the oxygen exposure, Fermented or hard cider can last for over a year, and certainly until the next apple harvest. With any extended exposure to oxygen, juice may take on acetobacters, which produce acetic acid and allow the juice to become cider vinegar. Apples are made up of many different flavor compounds, but three of the most prominent properties of an apple are sweetness, tannins, and acid. The apples that are preferred for eating are usually high in sweetness and hold different levels of acidity. While sweeter varieties might make a lovely sweet cider, high levels of tannins are preferred for a fermented cider. Tannic apples are bitter and tannins in a drink, like wine, will have the effect of sucking all the moisture out of one's mouth. They balance out the acidity, alcohol, and sugar in flavor. Tannins offer properties that aid in the fermenting process, like preservation against spoilage. Ciders are often blended with apples that are classified as sharp, bitter sharp, bitter sweet, and sweet. 
Today, we think of highly tannic apples as crab apples. In countries with robust hard cider industries, there are varieties bred specifically for cider with a balance of sweetness, acidity, and tannins. Since the cider fermentation process is a natural occurrence, there is no clear historic starting point to cider traditions. Myriad historic references and representations of apples, trees, juice presses, and customs denote the fruit's presence throughout history and geography. The cider story traverses through ancient empires, middle century monarchies, colonialism, and into modern times. The modern culture and traditions, especially around production and consumption of apple cider, roots itself in its diverse past. History of outsider is still being researched and discovered to this day. The practices and art of apple tree propagation and fruit and cider consumption were passed and appropriated between empires. Ancient Egypt and Celt, Sumerian to Persian, to Greek to Roman, to Moorish to Basque, to Viking, and on and on. These practices symbolized wealth, resources, and stability. Where there were apples, there was always evidence of cider and vinegar. The history of cider is not so much linear as it is multifurcated like the branches of a tree. Sumerian artifacts from ancient Mesopotamia show early evidence of fruit trees. Ancient Egyptian artifacts hold trace evidence of cider vinegar, and Cleopatra in her famed response to Mark Antony's retort that she could spend a small fortune on a meal, reportedly dissolved a pearl in cider vinegar and drank it. Pliny the Elder, a recorder of Roman era history, mentions Asturian apple and pear wine production during this period. More modern cider traditions started in Europe in the middle centuries when the Moors took the Basque region of Asturias, later designated as part of Spain, after the fall of the Roman Empire, they established rich botanical traditions. This period is said to be the time when the cultivation of tannic, bitter apples used for Spanish cider flourished. Cider production expanded through Europe, and as people preferred its taste to beer, became a primary beverage drunk throughout the continent. In Asturias, in the 16th century, cideries, or sagardoas, including a few which still exist today, grew apples, produced cider, and transported the cider by boat into the city of San Sebastian. The cider was shared with the community at cider houses and shipped off with whalers and traders across the Atlantic. Today, every winter, cidrerias, or cideries, in the Basque region, celebrate the cider being ready to drink with the tradition of choch. A large chestnut barrel filled with cider is tapped and drinkers line up to catch the sidra or cider in their cups. They drink their share as they get back in line and wait for their next sip. The Basque of Asturias and the Normans would have traded and met in their Atlantic travels. Norman means North Man, and many of them were Vikings that had moved south from Scandinavia in the early 9th century. Vikings were keen cider drinkers, and this explains why in France, a land dominated by wine, there is also a proud tradition of cider in Normandy, which exists to this day. After the Normans invaded England in 1066, they improved old cider making techniques by introducing cider apples. They planted orchards and brought pressing technology with them to make the extraction of juice from apples more efficient. Between the 14th and 19th century, Western Europe underwent the Little Ice Age. Apples can survive cooler temperatures, whereas grapes need a warmer climate, and so began a golden age for cider at the expense of wine. Along with the weather, political factors had a major impact. 
War with France and Spain interrupted wine, brandy, and sherry imports into England. To create new domestic beverages, some aristocrats with orchards and estates started experimenting with cider, cross-pollination of apple cultivars, glassware, and quartz. There's evidence in the archive of the Royal Society in London that 17th century cider makers were producing sparkling cider using a secondary fermentation in reinforced glass bottles sealed with quartz. In post-Norman England, the tradition of wassailing arose in the winters, where drinkers would visit orchards with their cider, pour some out, and sing to the trees in hopes of a good harvest for the coming year. Upon colonization of the Americas, Europeans brought apples and cider traditions to the new land. Orchards were planted as means of settling and community presses became commonplace. Famed Johnny Appleseed traveled westward and planted trees as a means of establishing new roots, both literally and figuratively, and building new settlements. Cider was drunk by Americans of all ages since it was often safer than water, and natural fermentation of cider often produced a low alcohol content of only 4 to 5 percent. But during Prohibition, to curb alcohol consumption, these early orchards were cut down or burned. Beer, made from grains, which could be harvested every year, took over cider's market when Prohibition ended. Today, Britons are the biggest consumers of cider per capita, and 56% of apples grown in the UK go to make cider. France, Germany, and Spain have rich traditions of cider and bring up Europe's share of the market. In the U.S. today, sweet cider is common and hard cider is the fastest growing on the alcoholic beverage production market. There are hundreds of craft producers across the country, though they must now compete with large manufacturers like Boston Beer Company and Stella Artois. Apples are grown as a commodity on the global market and are increasingly produced for sweetness, prolonged shelf life, efficiency of production, and appearance. There are a number of smaller industries around the world dedicated to the craft of cider and growing cider apples. Often these makers distinguish themselves using the specified apple characteristics and historic traditions of production. It will be interesting to see if the apple and cider industries reflect the diversity and expansion of their rich history or whether they will see the effects of consolidation and replication of the modern world. Wow, that was so interesting. And now I'm really thirsty for cider. I wish I would have brought one with me. We're so excited to see you tomorrow, same place and time for the next installment of An Apple a Day, when we'll head to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science to dissect an apple together. This one's super family friendly, so if you want to coordinate a Zoom with your favorite kids, um, and family members, this one's gonna be a lot of fun. Reminder, if you enjoy today's programming, please consider making a gift to support our museums and future programming like this. See you soon.